Hey guys, welcome to the start of yet another restoration project. Now this is a set for a customer, but it is an uncommon, if not rare set. It's in really good condition, has some unusual features. So it uh, could be a little more interesting than the endless predictors we've been doing. I have not looked at this set since the owner dropped it off. This is the first time I've even looked at the back of it. The first thing that hit me in the face was... Somebody cut a hole out of it. This was not an accident. This, there are saw marks. Somebody intentionally cut this out, which is such a tragedy. Because uh, not only is it an uncommon, rarish set, I'm not saying it's worth a fortune, but to collectors, to serious collectors, this is a big problem because backs are often missing or damaged. And other than this, it's pristine. All the original screws are even there and all the labels. And it's a pretty complicated back. Reproducing this would be an insane amount of work. I made it a masonite. Many, many, many holes and a somewhat complicated pattern because occasionally there are spots where they didn't drill a hole. <laughs> and it had these slots in it and openings for the antenna connection and power cord. Ah, why, why, why? I hope it's not because they thought it needed more ventilation. I have encountered folks who aren't familiar with tube equipment uh, that ha get a set and operate it for a while and think it's overheating, it's burning up, and think it needs to have maybe a fan added, more ventilation, whatever. These sets, especially these early sets, they may kick out 300 watts. Yeah, it's a 10-inch tabletop set. 300 watts. Uh, they produce a lot of heat by design. Uh, plenty of ventilation holes. I'm sure it has a perforated bottom. Plenty of airflow. There's even a whole bunch of holes in the chassis, so convection currents are going to flow. I'm not saying they don't need ventilation. They do. Don't put a towel over it or block the holes or anything. But you don't need to do that. You don't need, that otherwise, what, do they want access to the ion trap magnet without taking the back off? <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing else here. Uh, I, I, I'm at a loss. I'm kind of PO'd, but... Uh, at least we get to get the set running, hopefully. Oh yeah, and one other very important component to this back is the AC interlock. Uh, why, 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 why? So that is weird. The AC interlock is on the top of the chassis. It does a right angle bend. <laughs> And then the power cord comes out the back. No idea why they would have done that. Well, some idea. This does have a completely flush back. Usually there's some kind of stuff sticking out, like screw terminals or a you know, more conventional power cord would be sticking out like that. I, 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 don't, know. I don't know. But I do know that here's the chassis. Very, very heavy. <laughs> Got this run of early 10-inch sets, and they are all backbreakers. This is a big old power transformer. But not these. Ooh, wow. Check that out. That's why I like these early sets. You see bizarre things. That is some kind of crazy adjustable ion trap magnet. So the usual adjustment is you rotate it around the neck, slide it up and down the neck to find the sweet spot. This has further adjustments. You can use a screwdriver, or, or, or the, maybe that's just how it's assembled. But I have seen adjustable ones before. We can adjust the uh, magnetic strength of it as well. And that's all here. Which again makes it all the more interesting. It has all the knobs. Inside it looks like it's never been serviced. You have these nice little rubber blocks on the, on the corners. Why? 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 Did they cut a hole in the back? Alright, let's take a peek in here if we can. Oh, it's not even attached. Or it is attached, but just by a little, a little wire thingy. Uh, I'll have to review the film afterwards because I can't get that in there. Yeah, you are expecting a flyback, were you? Oh, no, 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 no. That's, again, why I like these early sets. There's no conventional flyback in this set. This is something a little different. Alright, but it does use its standard 10 BP4 pitcher tube, so let's 
test that out now. I have plenty of spares, so this uh, will get restored. That, that, that is a certainty. Using a BNK 440, just turned it on and it's coming to life immediately. That's a really good sign. It's glowing. Um, these came up in just seconds, so I'm sure this has pretty good emissions. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Barely have any cutoff control, but we'll let this sit. You know how the you know how it goes. You can see the emissions are steadily climbing, slowly climbing. We'll come back in 10-15 minutes. Been about 10 minutes. We're into the green now. Cutoff control is much more responsive now. This will produce a fine picture. So we will proceed. And hey, what do you know? This set actually only produces 200 watts. So, <laughs> even less of a reason to cut a hole in the back. Um, here's a look at the label explaining why you shouldn't take the back off or tamper it with the, the interlock. Uh, why, why, why did they do that? Alrighty, so I'm going to examine it, uh, put in my parts order, and when it arrives, we'll dig into it. And I'm wondering something too. Um, I wonder if this chassis might have had some connection with Philco. I kind of recall reading that some of the early Westinghouse sets uh, had chassis made by Philco, because those, <laughs> that's a hallmark of Philco. They use those corner rubber shock mounts. And tons of their radios and their early TVs. And this set has some Loctal tubes in it. And those perforated holes in the chassis. So I'll scream Philco to me. I tip the set on the side so I can get at the bolts holding the chassis in. And I wanted to give you a look at the uh, cabinet side here because it has a Rather nifty speaker grill. That's actually plastic. That's a nice grill cloth behind it. And down below we have three bolts holding it in. Bolt heads look the same, but I see three different kinds of washers. That's a good indication that it has been serviced at some point. There's also a mesh uh, grill you can remove to do some servicing without pulling the chassis. And unfortunately, we lost a foot somewhere along the way. We only have three out of four. There's the model H223 and serial X14245. All right, I'll grab a wrench, take out those three bolts. I already got the knobs off the front. And that uh, should just pull out. All right, got it out without any drama. Nice layer of dust on it, but otherwise, I don't see any issues from the top. There are two Loctal tubes, and that is, or those are, maybe I should say, what drives the horizontal yoke windings. Uh, if you've worked on uh, these old magnetically deflected CRTs, you're probably more familiar with the conventional setup where there's a flyback transformer driven by a horizontal output tube that uh, serves two, two purposes. One is a secondary winding that couples to the horizontal yoke and it drives the, the horizontal yoke windings. Then it also has a very large uh, number of turns on a secondary winding to generate the high voltage. You don't have to do it that way. They didn't do it that way in this set. The two 7A5s directly drive the horizontal yoke winding. Inside this box is an RF high voltage generator like you'd see in an electrostatic set more commonly. So the two completely separate isolated circuits. This is just a free running um, RF oscillator. There's a feedback winding on this coil. There's a 6V6 I believe in there. And this is a little self-contained high voltage generator. Kind of neat uh, dual Ceramic doorknob filter caps next to the high voltage rectifier there. 
So why would they do that when everybody else does it a different way? Uh, I suspect there are some potential advantages to using two separate circuits. Uh, one being you probably can get better horizontal linearity. See, with the flyback, it's kind of weird. I did a video, I talked about this a while back. Um, see, imagine there's no deflection at all, and you have your set turned on, your electron beam is going to go right down the middle, and it's going to be in the center of the screen. The uh, conventional circuit with a horizontal output tube and flyback and all that, when um, the horizontal output tube is conducting, in other words, so there's a ramp, go into the grid and when the tube is turned on and current starts flowing it drives the electron beam from the center of the screen to one side when it gets to the end there's that flyback period where the, magnet, the tube turns off the magnetic field collapses that does the other side uh, deflects the, to the other side um, or rather from the other side immediately snaps to the other side and then gradually decays back to the middle You've got to, <laughs> all that needs to be perfectly tuned and uh, adjusted so that the linearity when the tube is driving the CRT matches the linearity of when the magnetic field is collapsing. And <laughs> in the middle, you don't want to have a distortion, which yeah, is something you commonly have to adjust with horizontal drive and there's a linearity coil and stuff like that. Anyways, you don't do any of that stuff with this. This is just like the vertical deflection circuit where there's a vertical output transformer and a, and a vertical output uh, amp and that drives the vertical coils. Anyways, we, we will see once this set's running uh, how well it works. But uh, it's an often, if you try to adjust the geometry on these early sets and you put the grid up there, there's often a slight difference between the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen, and that's why there's different circuits, there's different mechanisms in, at play for driving one side of the screen versus the other. Not so with this set. So I'm expecting we'll get really good horizontal linearity. All right, let's look underneath the chassis. Well, now, that certainly looks different. <laughs> wow, there's a lot going on here. There's going to be a lot of work, too. <laughs> Boy, well, let's go through it. Uh, transformers, there are a bunch. There's a big power transformer. Probably a filter choke. Uh, that is a dedicated filament supply, I believe, for a damper tube. Yeah, even though it doesn't use a conventional flyback, there is a damper on the horizontal uh, circuit. Uh, there's an odd looking transformer here which is right below the dual 785 so that must have something to do with the horizontal. It looks like a pretty unobtainium part so I'll be very careful around it. This uh, may very well be the coil that sets the free running frequency of the horizontal oscillator. That's probably the vertical output transformer. That's probably the audio output transformer. Ah, uh, we got a whole bunch of bumblebee caps. Uh, looks like zero work has been done to this set. So it looked like the bolts had been taken out and put back in at some point, but I, I don't see any replaced parts down here. These guys I'm always suspicious of. These sand covered power resistors, they tend to start corroding internally and go open. Uh, there's a couple mica looking caps that may very well have paper caps inside of them. They're rather large and kind of suspicious looking, whereas these I'm sure are just regular micas. Um, yeah, <laughs> I guess it's going to be different. Tiny little tuner. Um, hmm. Alright, well I will let the owner know the good news. Uh, and this this owner I've done uh, I've restored a number of sets for him and he's got this remarkable knack of bringing me sets that are pristine untouched uh, in fact I have one more set to do uh, an initial checkout on I'll be posting that video soon but meanwhile I have ordered up all the parts and they just arrived so check this out 
This is what about 350 bucks worth of caps looks like. <laughs> and a bunch of yellow axials. Uh, a bunch more Adapta caps. And most of the rest of what's in here are electrolytic caps. So from DigiKey this time. I sort of alternate between Mauser Electronics and DigiKey. So this is the reason why I wanted to check out so many sets at once, is I wanted to place a big parts order so I could get the volume discounts. Typically when you get 10 or more of these types of capacitors, you can save 20 percent maybe more so most of these bags have 10 caps in them uh, occasionally there were some more oddball values that I just didn't need that many of so uh, in addition to these I also uh, ordered up parts for that so we're going to be pulling that chassis soon too it's a Dumont with an I think it's an RA 103 C or D chassis in it uh, and the Zenith porthole. So all the parts in here, let's, let's go through the list. Parts for the Emerson, uh, I think it's 571, that's my set. Parts for this Westinghouse, parts for the Dumont, uh, and parts for the Zenith porthole that uh, belong to this owner as well. So there's enough parts for five, six sets plus extras. Uh, well, that's just the capacitors anyways. Uh, I don't need to order up some power resistors too, but this is enough to get me started. So I hope you enjoyed this look at checking out a seldom seen uh, Westinghouse H223, I believe it was. Uh, it's it's going to be an interesting project. In the next installment, I'll uh, go through the schematic a little bit and show you some of the more unusual circuit features and... We'll get to start working on it. Thanks for watching.